to Donald Trump earlier, even before he was admitted to the hospital and said, I'm not going to be able to be at the inauguration because my doctors tell me sitting out there in the cold might, quote, put me six feet under, end quote. So what we have today is four out of five former presidents attending the inauguration. And, and, just, and just for the record, it's about 44 degrees in Washington. Rain has been expected, but so far it's holding off. And President Bush's father had said he was coming. And, and uh, he was planning on coming until, until he was uh, taken ill uh, a couple of days ago. Jan Crawford is watching the pageantry down there on the National Mall. Jan? Yes. We're, we're here um, at the Carriage House of the Capitol as, as the arrivals have just uh, started streaming in the moment that we've been waiting for. Of course, there's been a steady stream of people arriving throughout the morning, uh, but now you can see uh, the motorcade as um, uh, the president and the future president and the entourage get out. We see Melania here, uh, the, the future first lady. And others uh, all arriving to to go and, and take their positions where Pres President Obama will turn over those reins of power and President-elect Trump will become president. You know, uh, uh, Scott, uh, the inaugurations up until Ronald Reagan came to town were held on this side of the Capitol. And Ronald Reagan being an old movie actor and uh, his aide, Mike Deaver, they came up to sort of scope things out as they were getting ready for the inauguration and and they said well wait a minute the good picture is on the other side of the capitol on 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 the on the west side of the capitol and uh, for that reason uh, they decided to start holding it on the west side of the capitol and and since reagan that's that's where it's been and it is a much better picture it's it's a magnificent picture because you can look all the way down the mall to the washington monument and the lincoln memorial here you have the uh, the president-elect and the president for a few more minutes, uh, Barack Obama, making their way now uh, up to the stands. Ladies and gentlemen, the children of Vice President-elect Pence. Hello, everybody. Are you going to reverse the immigration order in the next few days? Congratulations, sir. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, look, Laura, we're moving. And there, of course, we just saw President Obama, the 44th president, enter with the soon-to-be 45th president of the United States, Donald Trump, with the congressional leadership of both the House and Senate. They will be announced along with their families on the west front of the Capitol, so we will see that shortly. One uh, piece of information to pass on, the end of the Obama era in the White House was marked by Valerie Jarrett turning off the lights, it is said. And so now begins what is this what is called organized chaos at the White House, yes. where they're doing everything from removing the president's Obama's and Mrs. Obama's personal stuff to replace by the Trumps. And here is Ivanka, Ivanka Trump. Trump, the second oldest child of Donald Trump and Ivana Trump. I'm walking next to her brother, Don Jr., and there's Eric Trump and Tiffany Trump, and there's Barron bringing up the rear. Melania, Donald Trump's 10-year-old son. Donald Trump has been very close to his family, as we all know. Yes. Um, Especially as they are adult children, he's become very close with them, and they, they work with him. Uh, the, the two oldest sons will, and you just spoke with you Eric know, Trump recently. You know what was interesting, Eric Trump, when I said, what's your biggest fear for your dad? He said, bringing new people in. We've been a very insular right. family. Wow. We trust each other. And he said that's been part of the hardest thing for them all to get used to. John Dickerson. You know, I, uh, this is, there is, 
such a weight on their father now, yes. and uh, and they are his support system and have been in that tight knitness. And I was reminded of um, FDR after he beat Herbert Hoover. He said to his son. He said, I'm just afraid that I may not have the strength to do this job. After you leave me tonight, Jimmy, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray to God that he will help me, that he will give me the strength and the guidance to do this job and do it right. And I hope that you will pray for me, too. Mm -hmm. A father leaning on his son at that moment in, in 1932. Um, and this is a this is a moment for a family, not just for yeah. a new and, president. And I think that that Donald Trump as president will lean on his family, in yeah. particular his his daughter, yes, uh, Ivanka Trump, who has left her business in New York, so that she can uh, help her husband, the son-in-law of Donald Trump, has been named right. a senior advisor. Also has a very key position, and they will all admit too, Nora, that Ivanka Trump they believe is the favorite. Which is unusual when you hear favorite children child. say that about yeah. the other, the favorite child. Well, and if you, when you ask people who have been on this journey with Donald Trump in the campaign, who can make him change his mind? It is Ivanka. She's let's, the one they name. Let's listen now Senate as they announce Secretary the children. Laura Dove and the House of Representatives Chief Administrative Officer, Philip G. Kiko. Um, Baron Trump and his mother Melania Trump will not immediately move to the White House because he's finished school, but when he does, he will be the first son to live in the White House since JFK Jr. And that's been more than 50 years to have a boy of that age. Yes, inside in the, White, the House. White House. Because, of course, Dub George W. Bush had two daughters, Barack They're Obama had two daughters. As we watch this, you wonder what are the thoughts of Donald J. Trump and Barack Obama? Well, what they are looking at from their vantage point is the entire Washington Mall, which is about half full right. with supporters. Um, there are estimates it could be anywhere from 800,000 to a million, about half the size is Barack Obama's. But look at this crowd. This is yes. what they see right now, yeah. a sea of people who supported Donald Trump throughout this extraordinary campaign and are here to witness this peaceful transition of power. What we will see um, once everybody is there is we will see uh, uh, opening ceremonies. Then the Asso Associate Justice Clarence Thomas will administer the vice presidential oath to Mike Prent Pence and then the Chief Justice will step forward to administer the presidential oath to Donald Trump. That oath must be administered before 12 noon, before 12 noon, and they're a little behind in coming from the White House, so they will make sure that that happens before 12. John, should we talk about this inaugural address? I mean, um, you know, he's going to be taking the oath of office on the Lincoln Bible. Mm -hmm. President Lincoln, of course, appealed to our better angels. Sure. What does Trump need to do? Well, I think, he, you know, it seems to me the key hurdle is not just to say the word unity, but to make people feel it. That's the that's the key with any piece of rhetoric. And and that doesn't mean that the day after the speech, everything won't change because he's going to start doing things and that's going to create either unity or division and actions are more powerful than words. But uh, as we've been talking about, this is a moment where he has a lot of tools yeah. that are given to him by the ceremony and the traditions of America and all of those ex-presidents who are up there with him and who, as Bob pointed out, didn't vote for him and the, the history and all that he's got available to him offer him a great opportunity in this speech mm -hmm. to create something uh, special and and it is a moment and those moments do last and they set the tone and you get we'll get a sense today for his sense of, of history for his sense of his place in history for his sense of how his movement fits in with a country where there is a movement on the other side of him uh, all those questions will be answered. Well, Susan Gage told us earlier today that he has not, that he has to deliver a spectacular address, that was her word, and that after the 
from election night, he hasn't said anything that has been unifying to the country. There has been, in, in Donald Trump, there has been a, a, two Trumps. The Donald yes. Trump of, of his kind of intense uh, Trump that we all know, and then there, the other at times who like election night. Yeah. But as she pointed out, there really haven't been the symbols of reaching out mm -hmm. since that speech. And, you know, and, well, that's and, a test and, of his presidency. Deep, deeps count, but, but small gestures can make a difference. Yes. Uh, and you were looking at, you know, the beginning of the definition of the Trump presidency. That's exactly right. These are the first steps. And, you know, like, just like your mom taught you about the first day in school, first impressions do matter. Uh, and now Donald Trump has got a, made a lot of impressions, obviously, over the course of a, of a campaign. Oh, shouting USA, USA. Let's listen. of Mrs. Obama and Dr. Biden, and then Mrs. Trump and Mrs. Pence, and then President Obama and Vice President Biden, and then our 45th president and his vice president will be announced. Interesting to see Ohio Governor John Kasich yeah. sitting in the audience today. Right. Scott Pelley and Bob Schieffer are also with us. Scott? Nora, we've got about 45 minutes to go, a little bit... Uh a little bit over 45 minutes to go, as prescribed by the 20th Amendment to the Constitution, which says that the oath must be administered by noon on January the 20th. But only part of what we're seeing today that is written into the Constitution is the President's 35-word oath. All the rest is traditional and also governed by the 20th Amendment to the Constitution. Bob Schieffer, as we were looking at some of the pictures of the National Mall, 45 minutes away from the inauguration, the crowd is, by historic standards, a little bit thin. Uh, yes, it is. It's an enormous crowd. I mean, uh, these things draw an enormous number of people, but uh, compared to, say, uh, the Obama inauguration, uh, this is probably a third, I would say, uh, the size of the crowd uh, that showed up. But that, that was the largest crowd in the history of Washington, the largest number of people to descend on the city at one time. But as you can see, those look like uh, ice skating arenas there. Actually, what they have done is they've laid down this kind of a carpet of uh, white plastic there to protect the grass on the mall. And as you can see, uh, it's it's far from being filled in, but um, it's still it's still a good sized crowd. I'm going to bet that that high angle shot we just looked at was from the Washington Monument, and uh, in previous administrations, previous inaugurations, you've seen that entire area there completely filled up, certainly in uh, Mr. Obama's first inauguration, which was tremendously historic for uh, the obvious reasons. Uh, it's been estimated that the crowd was well over one million. Here comes the former first, or the first lady, first lady for another 45 minutes, and Dr. Jill Biden. You know, the Obamas, of course, they're, they're going to fly away in the helicopter when this is over and, and go, I think, uh, somewhere in Florida. But then they'll be coming, Palm Springs, I think it is, and then they'll be uh, coming back to Washington. They're going to live just down the street from the White House uh, in the Calorama area, uh, just off Massachusetts Avenue. 
Very nice neighborhood. I used to live there. <laughs> but then my kids grew up and my wife got tired of mowing the lawn and so... <laughs> and of course they're, they will be there as their, uh, their daughters remain in school. Yeah. President Obama said in his last news conference uh, a few days ago that he was not going to run for office again. His name wouldn't be on any ballot, but he promised to be part of the national debate on those issues that he holds dear, including things uh, that he, he said, uh, including things like immigration and social justice and reform of the criminal justice system. But I think he'll be Scott quiet for a while. He, he said that. He said, I Secretary just want to be quiet for a while. Energy There's Rick Perry. Former governor of Texas, now the nominee to be energy secretary, once called for the, dis the uh, dismantling of the energy department uh, yesterday before Congress. He apologized for that. He said he'd learned so much about the work that the energy department does that he, fi he figures that it would be worth keeping around. Of course, Bernie Sanders, uh, the insurgent candidate on the Democratic side who gave Hillary Clinton such a run for her money. Ladies and gentlemen, the First Lady, Mrs. Michelle Obama, and the wife of the Vice President, Dr. Jill Biden, escorted by the Democratic Staff Director of the United States Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, Kelly Fado, Ms. Irish Weinshall, and Mr. Paul Pelosi. It's important to remember that the, the First Lady and Dr. Biden, it's an unpaid position, and they do, they, they give up their lives in many ways to do great public service. And these two have become very close friends, very and they have friends. worked so hard to bring attention to our men and women in the military. Yeah, they've become close, as their husbands have as well. And I think that this is going to be a lifelong friendship on both sides. They have great affection for each other. Mm -hmm. And of course, they're alongside Clinton. the Clintons as they watch this moment. It's not always been easy for Mrs. Obama as First Lady. She's talked about some of the constraints, and they say they're looking forward not only to sleeping in, but also just going to the grocery store. <laughs> no, I've heard her say, I'll be excited just to be able to roll my window down. Yeah. Yes. Without people getting alarmed at that. Yeah. Uh, so they've, and they will be leaving Washington in about an hour. Uh, it won't be Marine One, because when you're on the helicopter, it's called Executive One, but they will take off to Andrews Air Force Base and then fly a plane that's formerly it's the same as Air Force One, but it's not called Air Force One when he's not on it to go to take yeah. a vacation. Yeah, heading to Palm Springs, California. They said they both need some downtime. It'll be interesting to see who's going to be on the plane with them when they take off today. And, and if they follow tradition, they'll meet with staff at Andrews before, mm -hmm. as they leave the helicopter and go to the plane taking them to Palm Springs. Um, Up next, we are waiting. Mrs. Trump and Mrs. Pence to be announced, the future First Lady. Let's listen. Leadership. Mrs. Blunt, Elaine Chow, Paul Ryan's wife.
Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Melania Trump and Mrs. Karen Pence, escorted by the Secretary of the Senate, Julie Adams, the Clerk of the House of Representatives, Karen Haas, Mrs. Abigail Blunt, Mrs. Jana Ryan, the Honorable Elaine L. Chow, and Mrs. Judy McCarthy. President and the Vice President coming in, ahead of them the Speaker of the House and the Democratic Majority Minority Leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, all in anticipation of this magical moment of the transfer of power, waiting for the President-elect to come forward to obviously uh, the great, great joy of so many people in the audience who've come here who supported him and now come to see him and his team take power. And as President Obama gets on former Marine One to fly to Andrews Air Force Base, Joe Biden's getting on the Amtrak to, to go, go home to, to Delaware. Delaware. Going home to Delaware. <laughs> Which he did every day of his and life as a senator. That's right. Yeah. And he says he's going to have a cheeseburger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's how he will. That's Sounds good old like Joe. A good Regular plan. Joe. Even just like he came. Let's listen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, the Honorable Barack H. Obama, and the Vice President Joseph R. Biden, escorted by Senate Democratic Secretary Gary Myrick, Senate Democratic Leader and Rules Committee Ranking Member Charles E. Schumer, and House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. President Obama shaking hands with the Trump family as they await their father. When President-elect Trump is announced, that will then officially begin the ceremony. Mm -hmm. President Bush and President Trump exchanging mm -hmm. greetings. Bush <laughs> smiling. Yeah. President Carter There's looking President on. President Carter. Yeah. First Lady going back to greet him. Nice. So much history. So much Along history. On stage, yes.
president-elect. There we see the president-elect as he comes forward to be greeted by a crowd that's already beginning to say Trump, Trump, mm -hmm. Trump. Uh, behind Paul Ryan, the Speaker of the House, and Kevin McCarthy. What must he be thinking, John, at this moment as he's walking down? You see a sea of humanity waiting for you, and you hear the calls, as Charlie pointed out, of Trump, Trump, Trump. This is his moment right now. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, what he's thinking, but it is a solitary job, and yes. while he is walking in a group, he's all alone. That's it. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President-Elect, Michael Richard Pence. Ladies and gentlemen, escorting the President-elect, the Staff Director for the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, Stacey McHatton McBride, the Senate Sergeant-at-Arms, Frank Larkin, the House Sergeant-at-Arms, Paul Irving, the Chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, Roy Blunt, Rules Committee Ranking Member and Senate Democratic Leader, Charles E. Schumer, the Speaker of the House of Representatives, Paul D. Ryan, Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, House Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy and House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi. Ladies and gentlemen, the President-elect of the United States, Donald John Trump.
Ladies and gentlemen, the chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee for Inaugural Ceremonies, the Honorable Roy Blunt. Thank you all. If you, if you have a seat, you can sit down. Mr. President, Mr. Vice President, Mr. President-elect, Mr. Vice President-elect, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the inauguration of the 45th President of the United States of America. Today, the legislative, the executive, the judicial branches of our constitutional government come together for the 58th inauguration of the President of the United States. Millions of people all over the world will watch and will listen to this event. 36 years ago at his first inauguration, it was also the first inauguration on this side of the Capitol, President Ronald Reagan said that what we do here is both commonplace and miraculous. Commonplace every four years since 1789, when President George Washington took this exact same oath. Miraculous, because we've done it every four years since 1789, and the example it sets for democracies everywhere. Washington believed the inauguration of the second president would be more important than the inauguration of the first. Many people had taken control of a government up until then, but few people had ever turned that control willingly over to anyone else. And as important as the transfer of the, the first transfer of power was, many historians believe that the next election was even more important. When in 18 and 1, one group of people, arguably for the first time ever in history, willingly, if not enthusiastically, gave control of the government to people they believed had a dramatically different view of what the government would, should, and could do. After that election that actually discovered a flaw in the Constitution itself, which was, which was remedied by the 12th Amendment, Thomas Jefferson at that inauguration, beyond the chaos of the election that had just passed, said, we are all Republicans, we are all Federalists. After four years of civil war, Lincoln's second inaugural speech tried to find reason for the continued war when he pointed out that both sides prayed to the same God. He'd earlier written about those fervent prayers that one side must be and both sides may be wrong. But in 1865, he looked to the future and the memorable moment in that speech was with malice toward none and charity for all. In the middle of the Depression, the country was told that the only thing we had to fear was fear itself. And President Kennedy talked about the obligation in democracy to country. The great question that day was, ask what you can do for your country. So we come to this place again, commonplace and miraculous, a national moment of celebration, but not a, not a celebration of victory, a celebration of democracy. And as we begin that celebration, I call on His Eminence, Timothy Michael Cardinal Dolan, Reverend Dr. Samuel Rodriguez, and Pastor Paula White Kane to provide readings and the invocation. The prayer of King Solomon from the Book of Wisdom. Let us pray. God of our ancestors and Lord of mercy, you have made all things, and in your providence have charged us to rule the creatures produced by you, to govern the world in holiness and righteousness, and to render judgment with integrity of heart. Give us wisdom. For we are your servants, weak and short-lived, lacking in comprehension of judgment and of laws. Indeed, though one might be perfect among mortals, if wisdom 
which comes from you be lacking, we count for nothing. Now with you is wisdom, who knows your will and was there when you made the world, who understands what is pleasing in your eyes, what is conformable with your commands. Send her forth from your holy heavens, from your glorious throne dispatch her, that she may be with us and work with us, that we may grasp what is pleasing to you. For she knows and understands all things and will guide us prudently in our affairs and safeguard us by her glory. Amen. From the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. He blesses those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. For you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on its stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see, that everyone will praise your heavenly Father, respectfully in Jesus' name. We come to you, heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, with grateful hearts, thanking you for this great country that you have decreed to your people. We acknowledge we are a blessed nation with a rich history of faith and fortitude, with a future that is filled with promise and purpose. We recognize that every good and every perfect gift comes from you, and the United States of America is your gift, for which we proclaim our gratitude. As a nation, we now pray for our president, Donald John Trump, Vice President Michael Richard Pence, and their families. We ask that you would bestow upon our president the wisdom necessary to lead this great nation, the grace to unify us, and the strength to stand for what is honorable and right in your sight. In Proverbs 21.1, you instruct us that our leader's heart is in your hands. Gracious God, reveal unto our president the ability to know the will, your will, the confidence to lead us in justice and righteousness, and the compassion to yield to our better angels. While we know there are many challenges before us, in every generation you have provided the strength and power to become that blessed nation. Guide us in discernment, Lord, and give us that strength to persevere and thrive. Now bind and heal our wounds and divisions, and join our nation to your purpose. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The psalmist declared, let your favor be upon this one nation under God. Let these United States of America be that beacon of hope to all people and nations under your dominion, a true hope for humankind. Glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Missouri State University Chorale.
Voice of strangers welcome, we who once walked in in strangers' shoes. Once we were strangers, strangers, Well, the Missouri State University crowd practices and performs about two blocks from my home in Springfield, Missouri, so it was easy to find them, and we're pleased they're here. It's also a great opportunity for me to introduce uh, my colleague, the Senator from New York, Chuck Schumer. My fellow Americans, we live in a challenging and tumultuous time, a quickly evolving, ever more interconnected world, a rapidly changing economy that benefits too few while leaving too many behind, a fractured media, a politics frequently consumed by rancor. We face threats, foreign and domestic. In such times, Faith in our government, our institutions, and even our country 
can erode. Despite these challenges, I stand here today confident in this great country for one reason, you, the American people. We Americans have always been a forward-looking, problem-solving, optimistic, patriotic, and decent people. Whatever our race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity, whether we are immigrant or native-born, whether we live with disabilities or do not, in wealth or in poverty, we are all exceptional in our commonly held yet fierce devotion to our country and in our willingness to sacrifice our time, energy, and even our lives to making it a more perfect union. Today we celebrate one of democracy's core attributes, the peaceful transfer of power. And every day we stand up for core democratic principles enshrined in the Constitution, the rule of law, equal protection for all under law, the freedom of speech, press, religion, that the things that make America, America. And we can gain strength from reading our history and listening to the voices of average Americans. They always save us in times of strife. One such American was Major Sullivan Ballou. On July 14, 1861, when the North and South were lining up for their first battle, a time when our country was bitterly divided and faith in the future of our country was at a nadir, Major Ballou of the Second Rhode Island Volunteers penned a letter to his wife, Sarah. It is one of the greatest letters in American history. It shows the strength and courage of the average American. Allow me to read some of his words, which echo through the ages. My very dear Sarah, he wrote, the indications are very strong that we shall move in a few days, perhaps tomorrow. If it is necessary that I should fall on the battlefield for my country, I am ready. I have no misgivings about or lack of confidence in the cause in which I am engaged, and my courage does not halt or falter. I know how strongly American civilization now leans upon the triumph of the government, and how great a debt we owe to those who went before us through the blood and suffering of the revolution. And I am willing, perfectly willing, to lay down all my joys in this life to help maintain this government and to pay that debt. Sarah, my love for you is deathless. It seems to bind me to you with the mighty cables that nothing but omnipotence can break. And yet, my love of country comes over me like a strong wind and bears me irresistibly on with all these chains to the battlefield. Sullivan Ballou gave his life on the battlefield a week later at the first battle of Bull Run. It is because Sullivan Ballou and countless others believed in something bigger than themselves and were willing to sacrifice for it that we stand today in the full blessings of liberty in the greatest country on earth. And that spirit lives on in each of us, Americans whose families have been here for generations and those who have just arrived. And I know our best days are yet to come. I urge all Americans to read Ballou's full letter. His words give me solace, strength. I hope they will give you the same. Now, please stand while the Associate Justice of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, administers the oath of office to the Vice President of the United States.
next vice president elect to you raise your right hand and repeat after me I Michael Richard Pence do solemnly swear I Michael Richard Pence do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic against all enemies foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely that I take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion and that I will well and faithfully discharge and that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I'm about to enter the duties of the office on which I am about to enter so help me God so help me God congratulations <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, accompanied by the President's own United States Marine Band.
Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to introduce the Chief Justice of the United States, John G. Roberts, Jr., who will administer the presidential oath of office. Everyone, please stand. Please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations, Mr. President. What a great honor to be able to introduce for the first time ever anywhere the 45th President of the United States of America, Donald J. Trump. Did I get that one right? Chief Justice Roberts, President Carter, President Clinton, President Bush, President Obama, fellow Americans, and people of the world, thank you. We, the citizens of America, are now joined in a great national effort to rebuild our country and restore its promise for all of our people. Together, we will determine the course of America and the world for many, many years to come. We will face challenges. We will confront hardships. But we will get the job done. Every four years, we gather on these steps to carry out the orderly and peaceful transfer of power. And we are grateful to President Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama for their gracious aid throughout this transition. They have been magnificent. Thank you. Thank you. Today's ceremony, however, has very special meaning. Because today, we are not merely transferring power from one administration to another, or from one party to another. But we are transferring power from Washington, D.C., and giving it back to you, the people. For too long, a small group in our nation's capital has reaped the rewards of government while the people have borne the cost. 
Washington flourished, but the people did not share in its wealth. Politicians prospered, but the jobs left and the factories closed. The establishment protected itself, but not the citizens of our country. Their victories have not been your victories. Their triumphs have not been your triumphs. And while they celebrated in our nation's capital, there was little to celebrate for struggling families all across our land. That all changes starting right here and right now because this moment is your moment. It belongs to you. It belongs to everyone gathered here today and everyone watching all across America. This is your day. This is your celebration. And this, the United States of America, is your country. What truly matters is not which party controls our government, but whether our government is controlled by the people. January 20th, 2017 will be remembered as the day the people became the rulers of this nation again. The forgotten men and women of our country will be forgotten no longer. Everyone is listening to you now. You came by the tens of millions to become part of a historic movement, the likes of which the world has never seen before. At the center of this movement, is a crucial conviction that a nation exists to serve its citizens. Americans want great schools for their children, safe neighborhoods for their families, and good jobs for themselves. These are just and reasonable demands of righteous people and a righteous public. But for too many of our citizens, a different reality exists. Mothers and children trapped in poverty in our inner cities. Rusted out factories scattered like tombstones across the landscape of our nation. An education system flush with cash, but which leaves our young and beautiful students deprived of all knowledge. And the crime and the gangs and the drugs that have stolen too many lives and robbed our country of so much unrealized potential. This American carnage stops right here and stops right now. We are one nation and their pain is our pain. Their dreams are our dreams, and their success will be our success. We share one heart, one home, and one glorious destiny. The oath of office I take today is an oath of allegiance to all Americans. For many decades, we've enriched foreign industry at the expense of American industry, subsidized the armies of other countries while allowing for the very sad depletion of our military. We've defended other nations' borders while refusing to defend our own. And spent trillions and trillions of dollars overseas while America's infrastructure has fallen 
into disrepair and decay. We've made other countries rich, while the wealth, strength, and confidence of our country has dissipated over the horizon. One by one, the factories shuttered and left our shores, with not even a thought about the millions and millions of American workers that were left behind. The wealth of our middle class has been ripped from their homes and then redistributed all across the world. But that is the past. And now we are looking only to the future. We assembled here today are issuing a new decree to be heard in every city, in every foreign capital, and in every hall of power. From this day forward, a new vision will govern our land. From this day forward, it's going to be only America first. America first. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families. We must protect our borders from the ravages of other countries making our products, stealing our companies, and destroying our jobs. Protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. I will fight for you with every breath in my body, and I will never, ever let you down. America will start winning again, winning like never before. We will bring back our jobs. We will bring back our borders. We will bring back our wealth. And we will bring back our dreams. We will build new roads and highways and bridges and airports and tunnels and railways all across our wonderful nation. We will get our people off of welfare and back to work, rebuilding our country with American hands and American labor. We will follow two simple rules, buy American and hire American. We will seek friendship and goodwill with the nations of the world. But we do so with the understanding that it is the right of all nations to put their own interests first. We do not seek to impose our way of life on anyone, but rather to let it shine as an example. We will shine for everyone to follow. We will reinforce old alliances and form new ones and unite the civilized world against radical Islamic terrorism, which we will eradicate completely from the face of the earth. At the bedrock of our politics will be a total allegiance to the United States of America. And through our loyalty to our country, we will rediscover our loyalty to each other. When you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. The Bible tells us how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. We must speak our minds openly, debate our disagreements honestly, 
but always pursue solidarity. When America is united, America is totally unstoppable. There should be no fear. We are protected, and we will always be protected. We will be protected by the great men and women of our military and law enforcement. And most importantly, we will be protected by God. Finally, we must think big and dream even bigger. In America, we understand that a nation is only living as long as it is striving. We will no longer accept politicians who are all talk and no action, constantly complaining, but never doing anything about it. The time for empty talk is over. Now arrives the hour of action. Do not allow anyone to tell you that it cannot be done. No challenge can match the heart and fight and spirit of America. We will not fail. Our country will thrive and prosper again. We stand at the birth of a new millennium, ready to unlock the mysteries of space, to free the Earth from the miseries of disease, and to harness the energies, industries, and technologies of tomorrow. A new national pride will stir our souls, lift our sights, and heal our divisions. It's time to remember that old wisdom our soldiers will never forget, that whether we are black, or brown or white, we all bleed the same red blood of patriots. We all enjoy the same glorious freedoms, and we all salute the same great American flag. And whether a child is born, in the urban sprawl of Detroit or the windswept plains of Nebraska, they look up at the same night sky, they fill their heart with the same dreams, and they are infused with the breath of life by the same almighty Creator. So to all Americans, in every city, near and far, small and large, from mountain to mountain, from ocean to ocean, hear these words. You will never be ignored again. Your voice, your hopes, and your dreams will define our American destiny. And your courage and goodness and love will forever guide us along the way. Together, we will make America strong again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And yes, together, we will make America great again. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you. God bless America.
this time, I call on uh, Rabbi Marvin Heyer, Reverend Franklin Graham, and Bishop Wayne T. Jackson to provide readings and the benediction. Eternal God, bless President Donald J. Trump and America, our great nation. Guide us to remember the words of the psalmist, who may dwell on your holy mountain, one who does what is right and speaks the truth, who knows that when you eat the labor of your hands, you are praiseworthy, that he who sows in tears shall reap in joy, because the freedoms we enjoy are not granted in perpetuity, but must be reclaimed by each generation. As our ancestors have planted for us, so we must plant for others. While it is not for us to complete the task, neither are we free to desist from them. Dispense justice for the needy and the orphan, for they have no one but their fellow citizens. And because a nation's wealth is measured by her values and not by her vaults, bless all of our allies around the world who share our beliefs. By the rivers of Babylon, we wept as we remembered Zion. If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. The doer of all these shall never falter. May the days come soon when justice will dwell in the wilderness and righteousness will abide in the fertile fields and the work of righteousness will be peace quietness, and confidence forever. Amen. Mr. President, in the Bible, rain is a sign of God's blessing. And it started to rain, Mr. President, when you came to the platform. And it's my prayer that God will bless you, your family, your administration, and may he bless America. The passage of scripture comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings, for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. We thank you, Father, for letting us share this great moment together. Let us not take for granted the air we breathe or the life you've given us. We were all created by you with one blood, all nations to dwell upon this land together. We are not enemies but brothers and sisters. We're not adversaries but we're allies. We are not foes but we're friends. Let us be healed by the power of your love and united by the bond of your spirit. Today we pray for our 45th president, the vice president and their families and give them the wisdom to guide this great nation, the strength to protect it, and the hands to heal it. 
We bless President Donald J. Trump. We ask that you give him the wisdom of Solomon, the vision of Joseph, and the meekness of Christ. Solomon, who kept peace among many nations, Joseph, who dreamt better for the people, and Christ, who accepted us all. O oh Lord, mend our hearts and stitch together the fabric of this great country. In the spirit of the legendary gospel songwriter, Mahalia Jackson, oh, deep in my heart, I do believe. The Lord will see us through, I do believe. We are on our way to victory, I do believe. We will walk hand in hand, I do believe. We shall live in peace, I do believe. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe. America, we shall overcome. May the Lord bless and keep America, make his face shine upon us, and be gracious unto us, and give us peace. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jackie Ivanko, accompanied by the President's own United States Marine Band. Please stand for the singing of the National Anthem. gentlemen, please remain standing while the president and official party depart the platform. You will be released by sections shortly. Donald Trump, 45th president of the United States. And the pendulum swings as it does throughout our history. This time it swings toward a populist, isolationist philosophy part of the American debate from the earliest days, which has found its 21st century voice in Donald Trump. Bob Schieffer, that was not, to my mind, the speech of a Republican or a Democrat. He excoriated both parties. He called the American landscape uh, uh, an American landscape which had factories from sea to sea that were shuttered, people out of work, American carnage, he called it. I, I'm telling you, this was very strong stuff, uh, very strong stuff. I did not see any outreach either across the aisle or even to his own party. I mean, he basically took the hide off everybody sitting on that platform. Uh, telling them that uh, politicians in Washington have prospered while the people out there had suffered and he said it's going to stop here and now. He kept saying 
here and now. And just as you say, he talked about a more protectionist kind of uh, trade policy, I would assume. We're going to buy American. Uh, we're going to hide. Uh, we're going to uh, hire American. He said we have enriched other governments and defended other borders uh, while we fail to do that for our own borders. That is part of all this he's been talking about. Is NATO obsolete? I mean, we're going to be unpacking this speech for, uh, it'll take us the rest of the day to get around to this. I'm not quite sure I've ever heard any inauguration speech quite like this one. And here is Hillary Clinton, who won the popular vote in the election by 2.8 million votes. Donald Trump won by 77,000 votes when you add together the states of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, the states that put him over the top. Donald Trump used the word, he said, protection will lead to great prosperity and strength. Protection generally meant as taxation of goods coming into the United States in order to give American goods an advantage in free trade. The American carnage, he said, stops right here and stops right now. You know, Bob, unlike most of these inaugural speeches, I didn't hear Donald Trump ask the American people to do anything. Well, once again, as, as we've been talking about, people keep expecting some kind of a pivot, a pivot from Donald Trump to move from primary elections to the general election to the presidency. He came here uh, being Donald Trump and this was once again very much what we saw throughout the last two years. This was Donald Trump. Let's go down to Nora O'Donnell, Charlie Rose, Gail King and John Dickerson on the mall. Scott, uh, thank you. I thought this speech was a call to arms rather than an appeal for unity. It was the populist message that got him to the presidency. Tough language, talking about eliminating the American carnage, talking about eliminating from the face of the earth, a radical Islamic extremism. It was a call to arms, Nor. But we kept hearing that it would be a speech about unity and healing. And I kept waiting to hear something about unity and healing, and that never came. I think that's very surprising. And to say the way he slammed everything that has happened in the last eight years with the president, the former president of the United sitting States there. sitting there, listening to that after they had just come from tea and coffee together. I think a lot of people are very surprised by this tone today. Well, well it lacked Nora. the soaring rhetoric of most inaugural addresses that speak to our better angels, as President Lincoln and, declared more than 100 years ago. Instead, he talked about righteous people and a righteous public. I don't know that I've ever heard an a inaugural address where the words crime, drugs, gangs, American um, carnage, rusted out factories. So it was it was darker than than most inaugural addresses. But it, but it what? But it did speak to the electorate that uh, put him in office. That and, feels that they have been left out. It had echoes of his nominating speech at the Republican convention. This is a speech to, uh, you know, the emotional connection he had with that group of voters who felt Washington wasn't listening to them. It, but going back to Bob's point, the people arrayed around him were his first target. The politicians who not only acted too slowly, but who were venal in his description, who had sold out the American people, who were more interested in their comforts, he, he shot both parties, more interested than their, in their comforts than the American people. That is uh, about as big a, a criticism you can make of the of people in politics, and it's a criticism of the people with whom he's now going to have to work, not just uh, leaving aside uh, Barack Obama. On the rhetoric question, he was, to the extent that he deployed rhetoric, it was always in painting that dark, desolate, dangerous American landscape. There was none of that parceled out to anything uplifting or, or um, uh, around which people could unify. It was also a reaffirmation of his idea of America first. America first to restore jobs, America first in terms of taking people and bringing them back, whatever he means by uh, make America great again. I didn't hear a lot of applause while we're sitting here looking at the crowd. He got his biggest applause when he said we will eliminate ISIS. That was the first time that I heard a significant amount of applause while we're watching the crowd here. I'm curious to see how it played in the country, this speech. 
And America first means that wall, that protection, yeah. the, the American jobs, uh, American companies in America, no adventuresome overseas. These are battle lines within his own party, where you have a lot of Republicans who believe in free trade as a part of the, the capitalist system, and then secondarily, who believe, as Ronald Reagan did, that there are values worth protecting and promoting overseas for their own sake, and that to promote them and to, to exercise U.S. power as a way to promote those ideas keeps America safe. There was This was a real clear break from that. I just want to point out we're seeing now President Donald Trump and President Barack Obama, they are walking into the Capitol Rotunda. They are going now to what will be a luncheon um, with members of Congress and President uh -huh. Trump. And they, they will say goodbye to the first family, the Obamas, who will leave out the east front of the Capitol and board what is known traditionally as Marine One, but since he is no longer the sitting president, it will be called Executive One, and they will go on to this, their post-presidency life. This is one more of the traditions that are part of every inaugural day, you know, meeting with the leaders of Congress after you make the inaugural speech. In talking to people who've watched Donald Trump through his whole career, they define his opening gambit is often, as uh, Richard LaFrac, uh, one of his longtime friends, said, is to throw hand grenades at the beginning, destabilize everyone, and that that it is in some t instances a negotiating ploy, which is to say he knows ultimately he's going to have to be somewhere else, yeah. but if you start well, at the furthest edge, then you can come back to it. We're on the National Mall, and on the other end of the U.S. Capitol is the Lincoln Memorial, and on the Lincoln Memorial are actually etched the words from President Lincoln's inaugural address. That's why these inaugural addresses matter. They get etched in stone. What of this address does he want to have etched in stone? And that will be something to look closely at, to mark his future monument, to mark his future library. What is, these are the most iconic uh, speeches, are most, some of the most what, iconic things of American history. Yeah. Well, well, this what one is, is likely America? to be known forever as the American Carnage speech. Uh, that was mm -hmm. the most striking mm -hmm. phrase right. in it. He was speaking to, in my estimation, and only to, the people who got him elected. Let me uh, just add it one was thing the here. Speech. Let me just add one thing here, Charlie. Uh, when yep. the first George Bush made his inaugural address, uh, he said, we meet on democracy's front porch, a grand place to talk as neighbors and friends. This is the day our nation is made whole. This was not a speech, a friendly speech to the neighbors. This was serving notice that there's a new guy on the block and we're going to do things in a different way. His way. Uh, and His it, way. It, and it was a speech to those people who elected him. There we see the two, the former president and the new president, walking through Congress to attend a lunch together. No, 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 no. no, no. no. I know President Obama's not going to the lunch. He's going to be saying goodbye to him. Then the president will come back. This right. is the east front of the Capitol and the steps, and they will say goodbye. It's a, it's a beautiful wave goodbye. And the Obamas will get on the helicopter right. and go to Joint Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. wonder what they're saying. I don't know, but you think about this, and this is the way uh, the former presidents have traditionally left, but think about back in the day of Harry Truman. He put his suitcases in the family car, and he and his wife drove back to Missouri. What a difference a few years makes. President Obama kissing his wife's hand as they're preparing to head down the steps to the helicopter and leave Washington. President Trump said in his speech moments ago, from this day forward, a new vision will govern, govern our land. It is going to be only America first. new vice president sending off the old. I remember the day that uh, Ronald Reagan 
left and Sam Donaldson of ABC News shouted the question and Barbara Bush, who was about to go to the White House, said, oh, he got his last shout. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Bush and her husband, the former president, 92-year-old George Herbert Walker Bush, have been in the hospital. Uh, but late reports are that they are both doing much better. The former president has had pneumonia, but we are told that all signs are toward improvement and they hope to have him out of the hospital soon. So I guess the uh, former vice president, he's going down to the railroad station and get on the Amtrak and uh, go back to Delaware, which he did. And, you know, he commuted back and forth when he was in the Senate for so many years. There has been a little bit of trouble in Washington, oh, far away from the ceremonies. There have been some unruly crowds, some broken store windows. At one point, the Metropolitan Police used pepper spray to quell those crowds. But some people came to town today bent on trouble, and that in no way has had any impact on the ceremonies here on the National Mall. Let's watch and listen now as the first African-American president says his final goodbye. President Obama waves goodbye to the nation's capital as the helicopter, formerly known as Marine One, now prepares to lift off from the grounds of the Capitol. The new President of the United States, Donald J. Trump, and the new First Lady are headed back into the Capitol for a traditional luncheon with members of Congress and then he will be heading to the White House and there will be hours of parades and festivities that go well into the night. Some President Obama said in his final news conference that he was looking forward to his time after the presidency. One of the things he said was he was looking forward to when he wouldn't have to hear himself talking all the time. <laughs> Some of us in television get that same feeling sometimes, Scott. <laughs> It'll be interesting now, uh, some former presidents in years past, uh, that helicopter is lifted off and then headed down the mall. And of course, uh, we'll see if uh, that's what they choose to do today, to give, give them one last look at Washington, where they have spent uh, eight previous years. I'll have to check my history here, Bob, but uh, Barack Obama is certainly one of the youngest former presidents in our history, if not the youngest. Uh, he has a long career ahead of him. Yes, he does. And we'll now have five former presidents, uh, which may be a record number. I'm trying to think back.
President Obama's inauguration day, his first inauguration day eight years ago. It has been estimated that there were more than 1.6 million people in Washington. It was potentially the largest gathering in the history of the nation's capital. Certainly the largest in uh, the 47 years I've been here. A symbolic end to our traditional transfer of power. President Obama and I should say former President Obama and the former First Lady will be flown to Joint Base Andrews, as it's now called, the old Andrews Air Force Base. We can hear the helicopter going over our studio right now. Just a couple hundred feet above where we are. Right, right above us. Very short trip to Joint Base Andrews and then they will board a plane and leave the Washington area. Going on vacation. I'm always moved. I've, I've watched a lot of presidents leave Washington, and it's always a, a touching moment, for want of a better phrase, for me. Um, some leave happily. I remember seeing Richard Nixon leave in one of the most bizarre and almost surreal kind of scenes that I saw at Andrews Air Force Base, waving goodbye as he always did, and yet. He had just uh, resigned the presidency. Lyndon Johnson left a beaten man. The war had worn him down, and yet, as the years went by, we came to recognize the enormous uh, things that he had been able to do in the civil rights area. More than 400 pieces of significant legislation. We basically today live in Lyndon Johnson's America. That is the tower of the Trump Hotel that the helicopter just flew by, the old 19th century post office building here in Washington. The former president said in his last news conference that his family and his daughters in particular were disappointed, there's the Washington Monument of course, mm -hmm. were disappointed in the way the election turned out, but he also said, quote, I think we're going to be okay, referring to the nation, the transfer of power, and the president's former residence, now the residence of President Trump and the new first lady. Let's go down to Charlie Rose, Nora O'Donnell, Gail King, and John Dickerson. Uh, Scott, I, I'm looking at the speech that the pre new president just made, and he also said, uh, it is time to remember that old wisdom, our soldiers will never forget that whether we are black or blue, brown, or black or brown or white, we all bleed the same blood of patriots. And whether a child is born in the urban sprawl of Detroit or the windswept plains of Nebraska, they look up at the same night sky and they fill their hearts with the same dreams. Uh, that was what he also said near the end of his speech, but it was a call to action to put America first. No, but following up on that, Charlie, there was a, par a part that struck out, stuck out to me. When you open your heart to patriotism, there is no room for prejudice. And I hope that is at least a message that people take away from today. 
I think it will be uh, overshadowed by the direct I message he, that, uh, that he gave. Uh, and it was a warning to his own party with whom, uh, uh, you know, we'll now see how things move in practice. Uh, but if you are a, a Republican, he is putting you on notice, too. If you don't move fast enough and with the people's interests, uh, he could deploy that kind of rhetoric towards Republican lawmakers who he is, by today's actions and by his campaign, remember in campaign, Paul Ryan was one of his uh, chief targets, uh, that they will be uh, as quickly on the wrong end of his view um, as perhaps Democrats. I mean, you can imagine Democrats being more pleased with some of the lines in that speech than traditional Republicans in terms of protectionism and America first. This is now Donald Trump's Washington. And what you see on the left-hand side of the screen there is the congressional luncheon um, for him. This has actually been a, a tradition for more than a century, and there will be about 200 guests there, including the president and vice president, uh, their families, Supreme Court justices as well, all gathered there for several hours. Major Garrett reported earlier today that Trump had asked if he could just skip the lunch and get straight to work mm. <laughs> because he wants to quickly put pen to paper and issue some executive yeah. actions. And it will be a very short inaugural parade after that. But there'll be some ceremony that we'll cover. Yeah. But I think what we're getting a sense here is we see represented by these pictures, Obama has said farewell. This is an end of an era. And, oh, and they're and, off to California, yeah. the family. I, I do yeah. like that he told Steve Croft in 60 Minutes, Nora, that wherever he ends up tomorrow morning, he will not be setting his alarm. Uh, and, and I assume that that helicopter is making one last trip around Washington, as most uh, presidents or former presidents want to do. Yes. Let us not forget uh, that what we saw here at this inaugural day was a gathering of Republicans and Democrats, members of the Supreme Court and the Congress, uh, all here to yes. be part of what and, a democracy is about, and, the peaceful transfer of power, sometimes between people who do not see America mm -hmm. in terms of policies the same way. And that was certainly true today. And we're, today. Seeing, we're seeing the uh, the Bidens now. That's actually a train station. Uh, they're at Union Station here. And that was they quick. Are, that was quick. <laughs> that was not very hard quick. to go. Yeah, they, have held, they have held what's known as the 1 p.m. Excella uh, for the Bidens, who will go back to Delaware. Yeah. and. Uh, for those who know, uh, Vice President Biden, former Senator Biden, he went home, uh, went back home to Delaware every night. He's and taken more than 8,000 round trips in his career on been, Amtrak. He's been doing that since he was 29 years old. Um, yes. Uh, should be do some free ones, I would imagine. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> So he's back on the train. He's back on the train back home, also with uh, Senator Carper there as well from the great state of Delaware. And no doubt many of the conductors and those who work on this Amtrak know Biden by name, and he may know their children's names. I was going to say, and he knows them too. Yeah. He, knows, <laughs> he knows them too. And Nancy Cordes has covered uh, Vice President Biden and his time in the Senate, and she's also there on the Hill covering this uh, luncheon. Nancy? Hey, Nora. Well, the west front of the Capitol has now pretty much cleared out, and you know who one of the last people to leave was? Was Steve Bannon who is now going to be a close advisor to President Trump in the White House. He joined the campaign late in the game, and a lot of people have already said that they really heard a lot of Steve Bannon in that presidential address. It was very interesting. As the senators were filing out, I asked about 10 of them, Democrats and Republicans, what they thought of this speech. And frankly, they had very little to say. Most of them looked kind of shell-shocked. Uh, the Democrats, uh, of course, disagreed with a lot of what Mr. Trump had to say, but don't want to uh, go there on a day like today. And for the Republicans, they're mostly wondering how in the world they are now going to achieve some of the objectives that he laid out. How are they going to roll back the forces of globalization and modernization, which they believe are much more responsible for job losses than U.S. trade policies or U.S. tax policy for that matter? How do they simultaneously cut taxes and make this enormous investment in infrastructure? How do they roll back Obamacare but cover everyone? Uh, this speech was as much a challenge to them as anyone, uh, and they are going to be grappling with that challenge because, after all, uh, if they aren't able to achieve the objectives that he has laid out, uh, the objectives that a lot of Trump supporters are, are desperately hoping they can achieve, uh, then they, along with Mr. Trump, will get the blame.
Nancy Cordes there on Capitol Hill as we take a look at these pictures for this congressional luncheon um, that is well attended, yep. well attended by a group that's going to try and work together in these next several months to enact. Well, first, they've got to vote on his cabinet, uh, fill mm -hmm. his government and then fill his promises to the American people. John, do you think the president helped himself or hurt himself with this speech? Well, if he got elected because he was himself, then in this speech he was himself and therefore uh, he stuck with what brought him. Uh, I think if his goal was to unify people, uh, that I don't think this speech uh, did that. Uh, I think that... Um, if I mean, it's extraordinary. He's going to have this lunch after he, just describing all of the members he's eating with as total sellouts yeah. to the America, uh, you know, for their own comfort and selling out the American people. Um, but his mode in business has been to do these big opening gambits and uh, and use that to control the negotiation. And uh, this was his big opening gambit. And John, but it has worked for him. Yeah, it's it, it it a populist message that yeah. that put him where he is today. That's it right. put him where he is today. But on the other hand, he has to deal with the political rally, the, the landscape he faces, which is he's, his approval ratings are low and uh, he has an intense following, but there is also a lot of nervousness in the country and this probably deepened both of those feelings. The, follower, the followers who got just what they wanted and those who are nervous who are maybe more so. Right. You said at one point, John, sometimes his, his, his M.O. is to throw down a hand grenade and then dial it back. Would you describe this as a hand grenade being thrown today? I think so, yeah. yeah. To yeah. all of Washington, yeah. not just yeah, it wasn't just it, it was definitely a bipartisan hand grenade. You are watching CBS News coverage of the inauguration of Donald Trump coming up the parade and Donald Trump moving into the White House on Pennsylvania Avenue.